um, doing a sort of a, a third year on um, Fens and Wixel Moss, which is not an actual year. It's a sort of um, a virtual year because it's a compilation of, of several years. I'm going to divide the talk into four seasons. Again, not at really exact seasons. And I'll start off with just an introduction to the moss itself. Um, already said some things about it. It's a lowland raised bog or mire. I don't know whether people know what that is. It's basically a, a um, an old lake or mere that's filled in. Um, and over the year, the, the peaks built up from the sphagnum growth. It's the, as already said, it's the third largest flow and raised bog in Britain. It's massive and nowhere can you see all of it, although you can see a lot of it from the Mammoth Tower. Overall, it's not got one of the most diverse avifauna you're likely to find because I was listening before to all the birds you've got and some of the, the species you've got and quite a few, um, a few of them, if we get one. On Fens and Wixel Moss, people get very excited in structure about it. Um, at times, finding and seeing birds can be difficult. Some of the local birders don't call it Mordor for no reason. Because, say, in the winter, where you get, get the raptors, you can spend all day on the moss and just see a few crows of the odds reed bumps in and, and, and things. So, uh, it's not always the easiest place to see things, but when you do, it's a sort of sense of achievement. Um, the habitats around the, the, the moss, the, the main body of the moss is a low and raised bog, which is quite a depth of peat, you know, up to about eight meters of peat in places. And um, bog vegetation with lots of peaty pools. Some of these are from the, the old peat digging. Some of them were dug by the Peak Company. Um, so the fair, moderate sized pools. Um, but there's, a fair, there's a fair bit of oak water on it. Then you've got quite a lot of sparse scrub. The, the birds are regularly cut down to stop them taking over on the moss until it's free wetted. And, the de um, and then you've got denser parts of willow and that with a warbler habitat. Um, and then at the edges, um, we have some wet woodland, uh, which is woodland car called a lag around the edge of a, uh, a raised bog. The NNR owns some meadows on the edge of the reserve, some of it damp meadow on peat. Um, looks like old style meadows, some parts and sands with heathy type vegetation. The site's surrounded by abundant deciduous mixed woodland with some college for plantation. At, uh, at the north end. Um, the farmland surrounding the sites tend to be small scale farms, so it's um, not big, open, uh, uh, intensively farmed area, um, except for one bit. There's a tree nurse, a very large tree nursery on one side. Then there's a uh, wetland area on the, the edge of the moss called, now called Sinkers Fields. It's generally known to, to birders as. Um, the Wixel floods, it's former agricultural fields. Um, partly the flooded due to the uh, water leaking out of the canal. But um, both the Wildlife Trust and the NNR don't like it being called floods now because some of the locals have been complaining about the amount of water on it. Um, they built a bird hide which was opened uh, unofficially at the beginning about a year ago and um, in midsummer it was um, officially opened. Um, this is Sinker's Fields here. We get starling murmurations in the, in the winter as you can see. Um, not all the time, obviously sometimes it's just for a few months at a time. It's reckoned to be one of the best uh, wetland sites in Shropshire. Um, you get things like all free species of sandpiper and this is inside the, the hide here this is um, Helen Shackleton painted the um, lots of the pictures on, on the wall lots of them are painted from uh, photos of sensor um, on the right hand side you can see Lloyd Turner he's the, the one facing the camera he, he actually built it he's Helen Shackleton's partner um, and then we've also got a tower um, which gives fine views over the moss. Um, 
you can see for about uh, one and three quarter miles to the other end of the moss. That's my panorama photo there. Um, um, you can see some views there. Uh, the top one's the panorama photo that's used um, at, at the top. The other one's on a, a misty morning, but it gives you some idea of just how far you can see down there. So you really need a scope. Um, this is just a visitor's map giving a layout of the moss. It's about four kilometers long and about two kilometers wide. Um, so it's a fair old size. It's actually a collection of several mosses. You've got Fenza Wixel moss, which is the main moss. Wixel is the on the Shropshire English side. Fens is on the Welsh side, um, which is big. It's two thirds, actually over two thirds of it's in Wales. And then the other side of the canal, we've got Bettersfield moss and then um, Wem National, uh, National Nature Reserve. They're actually all one complex. Before the, the bulk was drained, there were just one long large moss. Um, this is just another common um, landmark you'll see. You'll often see um, if there's a strike there, they'll say it's out by the Weber Station or it's north of the Weber Station. It's in the middle of the moss. It's a, it's a uh, Met Office climate monitoring station. And you can just see in the background there's um, some baskets. That's a strategic starfish site from uh, World War II. And there's a bench there, so it's a, it's a handy place to sit. It's probably one of the best places for, for what, uh, watching practice because you can see high brand. Um, I struggled a bit to um, how to divide it up. I decided to do it in seasons, um, not natural seasons or sort of bird seasons. So. I've got late summer uh, into autumn because that's the end of, you know, the summer migrants, uh, they're leaving and then you get the winter migrants flying in. Um, and then winter where you've got no, no real migration, it's, it settles down. And then early spring when you get the um, some of the early migrants coming back and the curlew starts coming back to the moss. And then late spring into early some of the bird breeding season. These aren't going to be exact um, uh, divisions because some of, some of the, it varies every year with this dividing point. So some of the things, categories are put, the, some of the birds in are, are quite um, arbitrary. Um, late summer into autumn, probably one of the biggest changes you see because you start off with summer migrants still there, you know, swallows and most of the other birds. Um, you even get hobbies coming through till September. I suppose you could get one in, in um, October. I don't know, I think I've ever seen one there. So, But certainly into to late um, September, you still got hobbies coming through. Um, so we've got the swallows. Um, they're around to sort of October-ish. Most have left by sort of the end of September. And then we get the sandpipers coming through. This is a uh, common sandpiper, isn't it? And there we go. Green sandpiper and a uh, little ring plover. Um, <laughs> I heard you mentioning about all the fire crests you go. The, 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 the bird ringers got very excited when they go to a fire crest the other year because it's, it's not the sort of bird you really expect in that area. And I believe they got a yellow brow warbler, warbler this autumn as well. So you get hobbies coming through till um, uh, September. This one's got, um, it's got at least one um, common hawker in its mouth. You can see it's a male from the blue checks. This one actually caught a pair in flight. You can see it's very cleverly um, holding them between its uh, talons. Uh, they're, they're quite dexterous um, uh, hobbies are, and it's uh, it, they eat on the wing. We had a, a red strike. Um, that, it was the first in structure, I think, for 27 years or something. So that caused quite a lot of excitement. Um, I think it was it September. It was around so um 
And then wood sandpipers. I heard one this year. I was taking some landscape photos and it suddenly flew in. There are only sort of occasional where you know, wood, wood sandpipers are. And then I heard you saying about grey fallow ropes. That caused quite a bit, a bit of excitement when we got one um, uh, at, the, at the end of last year. Um, because they're not very common uh, further inland, especially in uh, Shropshire. Uh, Shropshire. Wheat ears, I, it, it's funny, this one was quite late in um, September, um, uh, October, sorry, I think it was 20 something of October. It was around a few years ago at the same time as um, one of the great race fright. And um, we get lots of field fairs coming in. We don't get as many roosting on, on the moss as they used to be. Um, but uh, they, uh, the strike, if they're going to come in, they tend to come with them. There currently is a great, great strike on the moss, but we haven't had one really for, I think it's 2017, and the two there, not next to each other. They had separate territory, separated by about 600 metres or so. Lots of uh, red pole come through in the, in the winter. The bird ringers uh, bring a lot of them. Um, snipe. We we have got breeding snipe now, but then of course in the autumn you get lots of um, migrants from Scandinavia and uh, uh, Russia, northern Russia, and that coming in. Marsh harriers. Um, this was photographed over the Tinker's Field. Um, this one, particularly uh, one, it was a few years ago, it hung around all winter. And um, I had a low hide on there with permission, and I had both this hen area regularly coming past, frightening all the dogs off along with the marsh area. It's funny, the, the dogs don't take any notice at all of the buzzards when they come over and pretend to be uh, marsh areas, but uh, they do know the birds. And also, this is one of my discoveries. This, um, on the webs walk, um, because I do one of the web strands, sex, we get very little. Maybe you look if you get, if you get seven birds on it, and yet, um, the um, at, at night I discovered after the sunset, you get absolutely huge amounts of um, uh, ducks and geese coming in. Um, I mean, there can be thousands at times, and this is just this this pool is, is used by a lot of. And you can see there's not very much in it. And then if you um, this recording I took after, after Dar, you can uh, you can hear how it changes completely with all the, the geese flying in there and all the ducks coming in. It's uh, quite a hyperactivity. The, 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 the geese are mainly just um, Canada's and feral grey legs. You do get um, pink feet coming over sometimes. Um, th this was an interesting thing the other year. There was this pair of swans, and they they kept um, chasing chasing this other swan off and chasing it around, and then doing their sort of uh, the bonding displays after. And this was quite a rarity. I got a, a, a rough legged buzzard in. Um, I think it was 2016, um, November, um, late November. And um, I, th I think it was one of the only ones in Shropshire. And it might have been the first um, for Northeast Wales as well, because you don't get many uh, rough legged buzzards sort of in the meantime. And then it turns into, into uh, winter proper. In winter, it, it depends. Sometimes we um, we get a lot of stone chats and, and uh, rebuntings that stay over. And, and yet a few winters ago, for two years on the rock, they all just seem to disappear. This is one of the starling murmurations we get over the, over the flooded fields, sinkers fields. You can see they're quite big. This one got even bigger than this. Um, a lot of the public come to see it because 
So you get a lot of snipe around it in the wind. So you often get flocks of 20 or so. Um, there's lots of them coming after dark. Not really, really many people knew that before I, I started sitting out on the on the moss after dark. I, I only found, found discovered it by chance, um, taking landscape photos of, of sunsets. And so I was there to quite a bit after sunset and uh, then heard all the wildfowl and waders start flying in. Um, one of the things we get over winter is um, Merlin. I've already seen two. There were two female Merlin having a bit of a clash the other week. Um, I've never seen them clashing before, but uh, they obviously didn't like each other. And there was a male Merlin seen at the same time. I've seen all to about five Merlin on the moss. Um, but often you just get one or two, and they seem to roost there a lot. They fly in in the evening, and they're sort of there to ambush the... Um, sort of winter migrant birds coming in. You get them sitting on posts um, around the moss. It's quite difficult um, spotting them at times. Um, we normally get a few head harriers each winter. They're resident, they roost there. Um, I'd say that um, we, I think there's only one male being spotted this year, someone did say they'd seen a ring tail, but I've only seen, personally seen marsh harriers so far. They, we're getting a lot more marsh harriers now, but um, it, the good thing about the male head harriers, when out on the moss, you can see them from a, a long way off, whereas the ring tails t tend to be a bit more cryptic and, and difficult to spot. Um, But there are easier places to, to see hen areas if to go somewhere like um, Parkgate and that. So it's more satisfying when you have to spend a few hours trying to find one. Um, la the last few years, they tend to um, have been flying in sort of in the evening. So they've been off hunting elsewhere and they come in to the moss to, to roost and then they, they leave the moss in the morning. You can see the two male hen harriers there. I, I think they're both um, uh, juveniles, these. As I say, we've been getting more uh, marsh harriers coming through. Apart from that um, juvenile which hung around all winter, they, they, at one time they just used to um, spend a few days there. Now we're getting them spending a, a few weeks, although it really is difficult to see and you know recognize individual ones mainly because you've seen them at, at such a distance uh juvenile gospel they're they're sort of occasional we're, we're not regularly it, they tend to turn up when there's a lot of wood pigeons um, roosting around the edge, edge of the moss sometimes we get you know huge amounts in the winter uh, roosting there so peregrines as well attracted by the same things um I think they also like eating teal because I regularly find lots of teal feathers out on the moss. And um, this, uh, we had this peregrine the other winter, and it had a pathological hatred of ravens. It knew its ravens from crows. If it saw a raven even several miles away, it would zoom in and then chase, chase, it, chase them all around the moss. Uh, um, it was very determined to stoop on them. It, Oh, it must have had some, a bad experience with them sometime. Um, a, a, another common sight in the winter, you get pairs of stock doors flying across the moss. Um, it can be that quiet. You, when you see something like stock doves, it uh, <laughs> can get quite interesting. Over, over winter, you get quite a lot of pintails. Um, I've seen up to about 30 odds. Um, they tend to be round till early spring. Um, and we get large numbers of widget, that, um, both on the pools on the moss before it's freezing and on sinkers fields at the edge, the flooded fields. But when it gets really cold, the, the moss freezes over and so you don't hardly get any um, ducks or, or waders left on it there. Um, 
sinkers field are a bit more sheltered than that so you'll get um they'll they'll stay there um so we're coming through to early spring now and um there's a few markers in spring. The, the curlews turn up. They, they they actually first start to start gathering on the fields. Maybe uh, uh, early February, occasionally the the end of January, and you get more and more. And then they'll eventually they go from flocking behaviour. They'll all be in one big flock, and then suddenly pair up about the beginning of March. I don't think this is actually quite quite usual. Lots of people who work with curlers don't seem to have heard of that very not that long. This is they, they seem to be taking up um, territories out on the moss. We had a spoonbill uh, a few years ago. We get excited at things like this. <laughs> um, and one of the other things you get in, in early spring turning up is uh, meadow pippies. You do get a few meadow um pairs of meadow pits on the moss over winter but they're not in numbers and then a lot start turning up in in late um early spring which is sort of february to early march um we had quite a few shorted owls turn up this year there haven't been any um well there's just been the occasional one seen for the last three or four years and uh, some of the NNR workers uh, put up six in, the, in one area. So we had some around this year. Um, and, and this is on um, um, Sinkers Fields. I, I just took this photo for this quite interesting water pivot lapwing and little ring plover together. And they're both, both sort of looking at the little ring plover. Um, yeah, I was hearing again, you said you got water pipettes. I mean, normally when they turn up in Shropshire, any inland place, it's quite an event. Um, the lapwings tend to sort of gather on the flooded fields at the edge before they, they go out on the moss. Um, this year we had vast numbers on. Here's the water pipettes catching a fly there. Looking a bit scruffy after a bath. And the other thing is we get large numbers of um, um, black-headed gulls which um, turn up around the end of February, early March. They, they breed on the pools. I think they're an amber-listed bird in, in um, Shropshire because they've declined a lot, the, the breeding grounds. You can see a typical pool there with a lot of black-headed gulls on it. Quite. This would probably be late February, early March. I think it's an early March, this one. And then we got huge amounts of um, Canada geese moving on the moss to breed. I think I, I must have the world's largest collection of Canada geese folks, those Canada geese in flight, because they are quite nosy. They fly around you to have a good look at you. We get some grey lag geese nesting over there. We get nesting shovelers. Uh, I was out with uh, Tony Cross trying to catch curlews this year to radio tag them. We found a uh, shoveler's nest. I've never seen one before. They've got quite small eggs, actually, a creamy straw colored thing, and the, the nest quite funny. Um, but some years we get quite a lot of shovelers out there, and they definitely do breed, as I was saying. This is um, when the curlews are just taking up. Um, the bit on the moss, they tend to, as I say, pair up and start taking free sort of territories quite early in the um, year, sometime about 3rd or 4th of March. And, but they don't actually uh, lay any eggs and nest until probably about after the 20th of April. Here I ended up getting mobbed. Um, I wasn't disturbing them nesting because then I was actually at the end of a public access area. Um, but the, the curlews decided to uh, get rid of me, telling me to, to go somewhere else. <laughs> um, so this is a, probably about six weeks before they, they start nesting pro proper. 
I know a lot of birders argued with me about that. They, they, they were sort of saying I was mistaken about them pairing up this early because um, most other places like the Stiper Stones, they don't really start um, pairing up and start calling until April. But they've got this strange habit there. Um, this is quite early. I'm, I'm not sure if you can see it. You can see little bits of frost on this. Is this early March? And um, this is another one. I've well, just got some recordings of the calls. We've got about. Um, it's difficult to tell, but probably 10 pairs, could be 12 pairs of curly breeding at the moment. As I say, I was out with Tony Cross this year, catch him on. You can see the the decoy um, stuffed curlew to the left and this male curlew. Tony said it's the most difficult place he's ever been to try and catch curlews. We caught one within about an hour and a half, and it must have taken about four or five more trips before we caught another one. He got um, two tags to, to fit to them. He, he got, I think, uh, 10 radio tags from Natural Resources Wales. Um, these ones have got a SIM card in. Um, there he is with this male curly that uh, conveniently got itself cool, fitting the tag to it. Um, the, as I say, these ones have got a SIM card in, so they, they connect to the mobile phone network. And it has given us some quite interesting information about movements and um, and where they, where they go off the moss to feed. Um, and this is another one we got turned up. This came from your part of the world, from Anglesey, the WGG. Um, it was tagged by Rachel Taylor and Callum McGregor and Steve Dodds. Um, they tagged it in, in, in Anglesey and um, over last winter. And then uh, I, I spotted it in, I think it was the end of February. And so I put it on, on Twitter to say, does anyone know who's using this colour scheme? And Rachel Taylor got in contact with me and she said, oh, that looks like WGG. And um, unfortunately, th th their tag system means they have to put a base station down within, in about a kilometre. So we only got a partial connection to it. So we got its movements arriving to the moss. It, it flew uh, overnight from Anglesey straight to the moss. Um, it flew along the north coast, down the estuary, followed the deal, and then uh, flew in there, flew across country to the moss. Um, unfortunately, we never got any more connection with it after. It, it apparently is back on Anglesey now. Um, so you might... It, see it sometimes so if you see any with these two green rings this white the uh, orange and white ring you know it's uh wgg just to prove that we do get uh breeding uh little ring plover on uh sinkers fields i think there was about nine um um this year um that was, that was the most spotted um I don't know if they've ever successfully bred any young. I know little ring plover are very prone to uh, getting uh, their nest predated by corvids and that. Um, and a Chetty's warbler, I managed to get, actually get a photo of one um, earlier this year. Um, I've been trying for three and a half years. The Chetty's are the ultimate skulkers. The, you hear them a lot, but you don't see them very much. Well, luckily, this one just sat on some vegetation by, by the drain across there, and I managed to get a series of photos of it um, out on the moss. Um, early spring, one of the birds that you get um, setting up to breed on the moss is, uh, uh, is uh, the linnets. Um, quite a few linnets breed on the moss. These are probably the most numerous small bird, apart from perhaps wrens that, that you get across the moss. Reed bunsens, they are in large numbers most of the time. 
but you only tend to see them regularly during the breeding season because the other time of the year they're down in the, in the vegetation most of the time. Um, I found a lot of the birds that turn up, the aphids, you get them near the junction of the bud and the, um, and the, and the branch, uh, the warblers do as well. So rebunds and some warblers, they spent ages picking them up. You can probably just see there the, the aphid is caught in its, uh, its bill. And you can there, you can see a chiff chaff. Um, and if you look in, the, in, in, its, in its mouth, it's actually got an aphid there. So you see them going up down the trees, picking these aphids off, which seem to sit near the buds. Um, so uh, we'll be sitting here in this again in a few months' time. I think I'm right, this is a willow warbler. Um, we see they turn up a few weeks later. We get a lot of willow warblers in the uh, scrub. They seem to displace a lot of the chip shafts as well. Now, um, we get a lot of um, stone chats. I'd say it must be close to maximum density for, for the nest. And they seem to have very good breeding um, uh, success on the moss. Because normally when I see them with youngsters, they've always get, got about four or five. You know, we very rarely see them with just one or two. Um, and then we get wheat ears coming through. We don't get wheat ears actually uh, uh, nesting on the moss. They're always on passage. So this one would be March, one of the earliest ones I got. Um, you see them regularly, but um, as I say, non, non actually breed on the moss. And then you see them coming back in at the end of the year. We do have kites. Um, they're, they're regular as open moss now. I think that they must breed nearby because sometimes we get them almost every day and then another year you just get one every sort of blue moon and then of course a lot of common buzzards around all the time and in early spring they start doing their uh, circling soaring displays oh uh, one of the, the big new bits of news is um, common snipe uh, nesting on the uh, on the moss. I got this one, uh, one. it was, um, they tend to cool more after dark. And then you can hear a grasshopper warble in the background. This, as I say, this was about an hour and a half after sunset, so it was properly dark. We, um, we probably had just a few breeding um, snipe. But it's only one or two sites in, in, in um, Shropshire where there are um, breeding slime. And this year after they did some bonding work to um, hold a lot more water in the middle, there was quite a lot more breeding slime this year. Um, had and drumming with that. And then we're moving it to sort of late spring into early summer, midsummer. This is really the bird breeding season. It depends on the species because, I mean, uh, stone chats seem to, to nest quite early. I think they, um, whereas some of the other birds don't really start nesting until May or something, April, late April. Grass off of warblers here. We normally get quite a few pairs. Um, it varies from year to year how many you get and, and, and exactly where they are. Again, the, the, the original skulkers um, it's, it tend to be in similar sort of um, territory. We get a lot of sedge warblers here. This, this is um, not this individual because it's the record. Then we get the first cuckoos to come through, maybe about 16th to 18th of May, uh, April. Sorry, the, the first cuckoos uh, will appear. 
it used to it used to be very good form. We used to get maybe up to seven or eight males, and then it went down to I'd say most of the time there was just one male. But then it's gone back up. We've had several, and I've been seeing females around. Um, and this um, call, I've got the managed to catch there sort of rough rough sort of noise the night this one was being attacked by a meadow pipis actually <laughs> a, a female had just uh, flown in a bit earlier and uh, so he was quite active calling and then uh, the meadow pipi took a, a dislike to it um, white throats are um, very widespread over the scrubby areas of the moss where you've got the uh, willow scrub and um, and a lot of bird scrub. You don't tend to get lesser white throats out on the moss, but you get a few on the edge of the moss by the canal and that. So yeah, um, stone chats are um, one of the, the big breeding birds on the moss. It's, uh, it's very productive for them. And um, th th this stone chat, I can get close to it. I, I, I suspect it's the same female because um, she's found out I carry emperor moth pheromones around. And so uh, oh. <laughs> she... she um, no one knows me as the man that attracts moths. <laughs> so she comes quite close to me. I got this nice recording this year of um, a pair of stone chats guarding their, uh, their youngsters. They were telling me to chat off. <laughs> Female stone chats are in quite incredible hunters. They, they go through huge amounts of invertebrates. This one's got a bee, which actually swallowed um, after this. Um, it's a solitary bee. I'm not, not sure which species. You can see it in its uh, beak there. This is one that's got an emperor mop. I didn't actually attract this one. I haven't got any pheromones this time. It's... Uh, it just snaps it, but they're pretty keen on them. And the female will shoot around after them, and like a, almost like a rat. And when she catches them, she gets the wings off in no time at all. Um, so a male emperor um, moth. Um, and this, um, as a four-spotted chaser, that this female stone chat ago. This this actual female was catching huge amounts of it. Obviously, they were just emerging. And he was also getting the nymphs, and he was just bringing them, conveying them backwards and forwards to uh, feed to its youngsters. And here's a rebunting with another dragonfly. This is a, a male common hawker. I actually saw it catch it, and it had, before you know it, it had its wings off. And uh, <laughs> as I say, lots of rebuntings with a very distinctive zippy song. Um, there are actually a lot of water rails um, um, on, on the moss. I've now seen them just about everywhere. But when I say see them, you tend to get a quick glimpse. More, more than anything, you just hear them. Um, well, I've, been, I've been quite surprised at the amount of them. Uh, uh, um, they take a bit until they, they actually reveal themselves. Uh, I accidentally made this discovery about hobbies because um, one of the highlights of the year, um, and Kathy will know about this, we uh, were filming with uh, Yellow uh, Williams and there was quite a lot about Yellow Retina was up to 30 hobbies. 
you get quite big gatherings. It's quite usual to see over 15, 20 hobbies. Um, this is about the first three weeks of, uh, of May. Um, so the, the, it's, it's quite a gathering point for them because they come here to eat, eat the dragonflies. Um, and what I discovered is that hobbies have got, you can't see it because it's fair, they have got eye spots on the back of their head. This is from um, Richard Sales, um, the Eurasian hobby, um, a, a, a monograph that's come out this year about them. And I um, I asked him about them because uh, I, I found photographed this one. And, um, and what happened is I uh, I noticed he got two eye spots on the back of his head. And um, then I got my scope out and I had a look at some others and I noticed when they twisted the head about 180 degrees, you could see them. And so I thought he was known about and um, he, he came to visit the mosque. I asked him about what the purpose was of that. He said, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> and then I looked it up after and found that um, hobbies um, were... were uh, uh, someone had suggested in Raptor research about um, 2004 that hobbies might have eye spots because American kestrels did, and they'd had a look at a few skins on uh, in museums and thought so they might have, but no one actually followed it up. And uh, so anyway, this this they, they tend to come in about late April. I think this was something like 27th of April. Now you can get get them coming in at about the 24th, 25th of April. Um, and then they come in and um, probably about three weeks, you've got this gathering. You can see that there's a large red damsel fly sticking out of the mouth, uh, the beak of this uh, um, hobby here. And it's quite a spectacular gathering. As you see, they can catch quite small flies. If you look, this is a sort of house fly sized fly, and they actually caught and ate it. Um, and this one here is um, there's a full spotted chaser behind it. And that black bit you can see behind the hobby is the head of, <laughs> of the full spotted chaser. Um, so the poor thing had its head knocked off, a decapitation strike. This one's actually eating a, a full spotted chaser. Uh, full spotted chasers are the preferred sort of dragonflies. They like they're a, a decent meal, although they will catch um, large red damselflies and a few white faced starters, the, the rare ones, but uh, they don't tend to fly upwards a lot. You can see this one coming in. That's a large red um, damselfly in flight just to the upper um, left in front of that hobby. You can see it's steering with its, its tail as it comes in to catch it. Um, this was around in July a few years ago, Glossy Ibis. Um, and then we get a few shell duck um, nesting. Uh, the, I came across this pair on the canal, um, and they, they've got several youngsters. Fortunately, one of them didn't look so well. <laughs> um, so. I tried carefully sort of shepherding the parents back, hoping that it might uh, pick it up, but uh, it didn't look very well. Oh, and, and this is an interesting thing. There's quite a lot of teal that nest on the moss. It's, it's very difficult because they're, they're such secretive birds. And I've been, I've come across quite a few, a, a lot of people have never seen a teal duckling before. Um, I know Kathy did um, ask me about it because someone's interested. Um, this year, that year, this is a few years ago. I saw three, three different lots of teal ducklings, but I'm guessing from from the amount of teal I see, ch the males chasing females, other ones around in the summer, the 10, 20 pairs, perhaps even more could be nested. But as I say, they're sort of secretive birds. It's it's very difficult to uh, to know how to survey them. Let's see some more here. This was in a, a different uh, on the other side of the, the moss. That those were on the Shropshire side. This is on the Welsh side. Um, you can see some more there. 
And here's some uh, fledgling um, shovelers. They've obviously bred on moss. They were definitely fledglings because they're all sticking together, uh, typical um, youngster behaviour. And, and this year we had a huge amount of lap mix. We, we normally just get, I don't know, six to eight pairs nesting around the moss. And Tony Cross, when I was going out, we, when we were catching um, curlews, he, he, um, he was amazed. He said somewhere's missing a lot of its lap mix, possibly 50 pairs or more. Um, out in the centre of the mosque, there's a lot of standing shallow water now, which does prove that um, it's just a habitat. Give them the right habitat, uh, you know, and they'll come back. And so uh, I think that's what's uh, lacking. Um, th this was one of three youngsters that was, um, they were out by the NNR base, actually. And here's one, a, a, a fledgling later on. So it's very difficult to monitor how many are, are nesting on the moss because, as we found out with the curlews, it's extremely difficult to find the nest. We, uh, even after big searches, we, we found maybe two, three nests a year with the curlews. So same, same with the lapwings. We won't find much more than that, even though you can see there's actually huge amounts of the displaying. So the nest in there. This was an interesting, um, I was taking a nature trek for around uh, Wixel Moss and we heard these two jays um, shrieking like mad, having a bit of a fight. And I saw one fly off and it dropped something. And I thought, there's only one flown off as it injured the other one. So I went to have a look and I found the, the other one dead. And um, it's funny, I took the group uh, just a bit further around, we'd only got about 40, 50 metres, and suddenly this bus had just swooped down and carted it off. He'd obviously been watching it all the time. I said, I'm having that. Lots of crows, unfortunately, around the moss. They're big nest predators, and they spend a lot of time hanging around. Luckily, most of the stuff they, they get in are just Canada geese and um, uh, mallard eggs, but... Uh, it's a big concern with the waders out there, like the curlews and uh, snipe and quite a lot of ravens around the, uh, the moss, obviously nesting in the area. Um, you get lots of kestrels in the, in, in, in the spring, the main, and then the new York males in, in the spring, the ones you see hunting out there. This is quite unusual as he's got a mouse because most of the time, if you look underneath this kestrel, we've got a, a, a common lizard. And for a few years, what I did is every time I saw one come down, I ran it close to it and then photographed it as it took off. And, and every one of them got a common lizard. So uh, that's the main thing they're out there for. And you get the odd wimbrel flying over. It might not be that unusual, uh, I suppose, near the coast, but. Um, in uh, uh, what's um, Shropshire, they're a bit like hen's teeth. But uh, when I was out with Tony Cross this year, we had a wimble come across, and there are pairs of um, oyster catchers. I, I don't know where they actually breed. I used to live in North Lancashire, I used to get, get a lot of breeding on the shingle around the bends of the, up the river loom. So I have no idea where it's that sort of habitat uh, around uh, the moss, but. Uh, you get quite a few pairs of oyster catchers, so they're definitely somewhere. And we get all big, big amounts of um, uh, swifts gathered in, in the evening to, to feed on the things, up, up to several hundred. I got quite, uh, at first I didn't get any swift photos at all, and then I started getting, after a lot of bits of practice, started catching a lot more. Um, I didn't realise before Swiss can look behind them in flight, uh, fly upside down. And uh, as I say, the huge amounts of flies in places that they, they gather to, to feed. I, uh, they, they, I don't know how they know, they just suddenly fly in all of a sudden from uh, quite a wide area. And we have breeding night jars. Um, it's difficult to know how many pairs we've got thermal image of this year. 
Um, uh, we only get it later in the year. Um, definitely about three pairs this year. There could have been more. I'd say in some years you have five to seven um, during males, but it's, it's, it's very difficult to know how that converts into actual, actual breeding birds. Um, they're, they're quite late breeding. Uh, you only start hearing them regularly from, from mid-June and right into August. Um, this is a female that um, flew over. I was fairly sure it was a female because she hadn't got any um, white wing tips. And this is with the thermal imager I got this year. Um, this was a male. This is in August. Um, I think it's about mid-August. Right? It was regularly sitting in these trees and children. I need a bit more practice focusing because it's not auto focus. And uh, here's one of the, I think it's the same male that was um, in, in these um, trees. Right, so um, I'll, I'll bring it to a halt here. I think we've, I probably whipped through it a bit, <laughs> quite quite a bit uh, faster. But Kathy uh, did say to keep you women an hour, mm. so. Uh, <laughs> oh, um, many thanks, Dean. Per perfect, perfect timing, and I'm quite sure there'll be some questions. Yes, yeah. After such an interesting presentation, thank you. <clears throat> Can I invite any questions or if we have any on the chat? I don't know whether any have come through by that channel. <clears throat> I'm sorry if you're getting a bit of an echo uh, when I speak. For that. <clears throat> My apologies if the microphone wasn't so good. <laughs> no, no, it was fine. fine. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. <clears throat> any questions from anybody, please don't hesitate to launch forth and give a lot of information on timing and that uh... no, no you'll thank you no, Martin can, can I, um, I um, just um, ask Stephen about the moss I've visited uh, Ben's moss a couple of times um, yeah. the hobbies and um, the, uh, the um, white the uh, uh, White, white, face, white face, uh, darters, the darters, the yeah, yeah. guys. But the when I've been to hobbies, I, I've been amazed about how hot it gets in the summer. Is, is that a feature of the peat or? Well, that's a very, that's a very good question because I've noticed this right, and when I've asked people, they they don't, they, you know, uh, they don't be able to say, but. It does seem exceptionally hot you, because if you go out, if you get one of these days where it's 30 odd degrees, it's like a furnace. Uh, you can feel the heat radiating from the ground. And also, in, in, even in the winter, if it's sunny, you get heat haze, right? Even when it's frosty. Um, so, personally, I think it's probably the, is the peat, you know, absorbing the, the warmth from the, uh, the sun. I mean, I've got the earliest ever records in the UK for two years on the run for white faced artists. Um, and so it, it, it is quite unusual like that. And yes, I do think it's probably, you know, the albedo because it's quite black, the peat. So you get this bare peat. Um, it, it does seem to absorb a lot of heat, yes. Uh, I've been there, it was, I remember one yeah. summer going there to see the hobbies on Fensmoss. Yeah. And, um, I think it's the hottest I've ever experienced in the UK. It was unbelievably hot. Oh, well, okay. Could yeah. I just ask whether, whether there yeah. are any breeding, breeding. Wood breeding? Sorry, Jeff, could you repeat that? Yeah, okay. okay. Are there any, any breeding woodcock? I don't know. I've never seen any rodent. Um, you get a lot in the winter. 
you know, around the edge, tend to be around the edges. They'd, they'd be the continental ones. But I've never, I, I'm familiar with Rodebuckock, but I've never heard or seen a Rodebuckock around there. Um, so it's possible, but um, I, 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 I normally they're quite um, visible, aren't they? You know, we're in the evening when they're, they're rodent. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Any other questions for Stephen? Yeah. Got some in the chat. Yeah. <clears throat> Can you articulate those, Gary? Okay. Well, first of all, Kathy says thank you for sharing all your knowledge of the TV program that's coming out with YOLO 2023. Yeah. Um, I'll let you read it because I put the uh, comment in the chat. Um, Gareth asks, what's the percentage success of the breeding curlew? Uh, well, this is what we've been trying to work out. I actually saw three, at least three, probably five um, fledglings the other year. This is the only ones that have ever been seen when I was doing a butterfly transect. And I saw, oh, some curlers. I lifted my binoculars up, you know, and the short bills, scruffy, fluffy sort of coats. So definitely youngsters, the first three, there were two behind it, behind the bond. But it's, it's very difficult to monitor them because um, I did warn people um, when um, Pete, the senior reserve manager, paid Tony Cross to do a survey. I said, you're going to struggle to find any nests. Uh, and so they, they were quite blasé about it. But uh, <laughs> Tony Cross has got to, got to respect it because he says they're entirely different than any other curly population is there. No. Um, so we, and as I say, we only find about um, one or two nests every year, you know, that we can put a camera on. And I've been around with Tony looking for them, and it's just incredibly difficult to find them. So with a the thermal imager, we were hoping for a bit more success, but... I found out it's not particularly good looking through vegetation. Um, and this is the problem because it, do, it looks quite low, the vegetation, but it isn't. It's, you know, sort of, I don't know, a metre high or so, and you just can't see anything. Um, and the curly do seem very good at disguising where they're coming down as well. So we have been trying for several years, really, to, to monitor the curlews uh, a bit better. Um, I will say that the population, it, it definitely dropped. We, we used to have 20 plus pairs, um, and it seemed to drop, but they seem to have gone up a bit because I did contact people to ask about head starting and that. Um, but it, this year we had May, at least 10 pairs, possibly 12. So, um, and so unfortunately, I can't give any more information out on that because they're not hiding any. This is why we're hoping the tagging might give us a bit more information about them. Stephen, may I ask, um, having never visited, what you'd recommend in terms of uh, how best to 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 visit and see see Fenswick so it, and how much of it is open access um well it's not an open access area but you can get there are paths if you um saw my if, if you write to the uh, nnr right yeah. uh, you can find the find the thing they'll send you a map um there are mosses trails permissive paths that go right round the moss um the, i always recommend the best time for people to visit is probably unless they're looking for something specific, is, is in May to June. Mm -hmm. And then it varies, because in, in May, you've got the white-faced starters, they're, they're emerging, and then you've got the hobbies. But you have to get for that gathering of hobbies the end of April to uh, about the third week of May. Mm -hmm. It varies. Sometimes they're around till nearly the end of June, <laughs> the end, end of May, beginning of June. Yeah. Um, and, and then you get the large heat butterflies. They'll come out at, at the end of May, early June. Most people come too late. They turn up in, in July and say, I'll come to see them. I say, 
or the books might say they're out until August, but they're, they're actually over with. And then you see rats, spiders and things. And so it's a, it's a good time to, to visit there. But obviously, you might be looking for something quite specific there. You know, if you're looking for the Harriers or Merlin and that, you want to come in the winter. Um, you do get the odd one in, 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 the, uh, in the summer. Is the Mammoth Tower open um, to it, general visitors or not? Yeah, 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 it's open to general visitors, easily accessible. It's, it's, you uh, approach it off the canal. Um, so if you go to Morris Bridge, Morris's Bridge car park, this is the main thing. You just walk down the canal, bank towards it. Now, the main problem you have is it's good for spotting birds in the winter. But in the summer, you won't see very, because of this heat, right? The heat yeah. haze. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter how good your scope is, you're not going to be able to see anything much above a few hundred meters away from you. But it's actually quite good for what um, you see in um, feeding hobbies, because you're actually looking down at them, and it's quite a good spot. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a good observation point in the winter, right? Um, but not in the summer, really, because of the, uh, well, it's, it's good for just having a look around the yeah. nest, but, you, you know, I mean, in, in, in the winter, I can spot, a, you know, a Merlin a mile away. You're not going to see any of a mile away, because it's all watercolour past the, yeah. a few hundred meters. There isn't really any facilities, um, so no toilets. There are at the NNR base, the manor house, um, but that's only open office hours. Mm -hmm. But there is a uh, Wixel Marina Cafe. Um, and then there's uh, a lot of cafes and truck stops uh, near Prees Heath, which is only about three miles away. And you've got Silver Study Blue Butterflies as well there during um, the summer. Wow. Thank you Thank very you much. That's re really good tip. Okay. Um, um, Ian's asking, well, Ian's um, saying superbly sharp photos. He wonders what camera you use and what settings. Um, well, the main camera you I mean for birds is a uh, Canon 7D Mark II and um, a 1 to 400 the Mark II version. Um, I also use macro, macro lenses for a lot, lot of the other stuff, but that's the main. Um, <clears throat> Um, set up or use. I have got a full frame camera, Canon 5DS, um, but it's not so good for um, what's well, it, the birds, flying birds, and that. Um, can I actually just ask a question? Um, you mentioned the Mammoth Tower. Is yeah. that named because it's big or because of the mammoth skeleton that was found in Shropshire in the 80s? Uh, well, I think it was the name was designed by committee, right? Um, so there were mammoths in the area, and actually, funny enough, in the in the manor house, the NNR base, which isn't a manor house, it's just some poor cabins. They have got a full size mammoth replica that's been there for about twenty years. I often show people in, and it's got birds' nests in it and stuff over it, but. Uh, I know about the, the mammoths that were found at Condo, but I've asked about it. I think they were just looking for a catchy name. They have got some wooden mammoth tusks right at the top of it now. So I think it's a marketing name more than, than, than anything. That's just something I wonder. Thanks. I think it's a pretty good name. <clears throat> yeah, it was made by Lloyd Turner. Um, he was in that photo. He actually built a lot of the stuff for the um, London Wetland Centre. And um, he used to be the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust civil engineer. Stephen, is it perhaps more of a common bird that's one that we sometimes uh, struggle for in North Wales? Uh, green woodpecker. When I've, when I've been there, I found that the moss seems to have quite a good population of green woodpeckers and they're feeding quite low vegetation on the ground. Well, it used to be, right? Uh, I mean, I, I've known it for a long time and it was always very good for green woodpeckers. Mm. 
And then the last two, three years, they seem to have disappeared. Right. Um, I don't know what's happened. I've spoken to other people. It seems that they've disappeared from a lot of other sites. There's been plenty of ants there. So I don't know why they, they've suddenly, because I, w- I would hear them on almost daily basis during the summer, and I don't think I heard one. So I don't know what's happened there, because you always used to get a breeding pair around along the canal, you know, and you'd hear the yaffling if you walked down by the canal. But um, And also along the old railway line, I'd regularly see them along there. So uh, I I don't know whether this is a pattern else, elsewhere. Um, I've been asking them around for that. If anyone knows anything about it, no one really seems to be sure what's happening. Well, you've obviously watched the mirror for uh, the most for a long time. Um, yeah. Have you noticed any any changes? I mean, you mentioned Willow Warble, and one of our previous speakers talked about how they've almost disappeared from an area because of uh, climatic change and everything's moving north, further north. So I just wondered what, what observations you had on the moss. Well, well, around the moss, there's a good population of willow warblers. Yeah, um, it's, I'd say there's a bit less, right? But there's still quite a good population. You know, you, you hear them regularly. The, the, the habitat seems to suit them. You know, the chiff chaffs come in and you've got this big density of chiff chaff and the willow warblers seem to push them out. Um, so I'd say this summer there was a bit less than previous years, but still good numbers of them. More generally in terms of changes with climate, anything that you've noticed? Yes, quite a lot. I'd say dragonfly, damselfly populations, I'm not seeing anywhere near the numbers I used to see. Um, say cuckoos suddenly went off a cliff um, you go from regular hearing four or five calling males to just just had one circulating luckily it seems to be more pairs back curlews the same they were used to nest right to the edge of the moss now they're just in the center um because there's less of them um there was definitely, I mean, I got a photograph in 2000, was it 16, 17, 39 curlew over there in a flock the day before they paired up. So there were at least 20 pairs there, and it probably wasn't the, the whole flock. Um, what other not? Uh, things? The hen harriers don't seem to be haunting on the moss. You know, you used to see them quartering around the moss a lot in the winter. Last few years, they don't seem to be on um, uh, Shorted owls, apart from this year, they they seem to, you know, largely disappeared. Um, um, I'd say nightjar numbers were down a bit, um, although it's difficult to tell they're spread out over quite a large area. Um, what else? I have seen quite a lot of changes, you know, just oh, especially over the last five years. Um, um, I'm not, as I say, we used to get huge amounts of um, field fares uh, roosting out in the moss. That's probably because they cut a lot of the bigger trees down. Um, not as many merlin um, over the winter. Um, so, so, I mean, lots of declines like Argent and Sable moths, which are nationally scarce moths. They, they, um, we started recording up to 70, 80 a year, and suddenly they've just gone off a cliff as well, just getting a few of them. Uh, um, so the, there has been noticeable changes. Um, uh, I was just trying to think off the top of my head. I think there are more things than that. Uh, Anything unusual moving in to take the place of things moving out? Um, more, a lot more marsh areas. You you would get sort of before you would get the odd one turning off. I, I I didn't actually see one for a few years because there was one of those things you were either there when they were there or but now I'm seeing them very regularly. Right, big increase in marsh areas visiting the site. Um, 
saw Osprey this year than last year, but obviously the all the egrets, right? Quite a lot of um, little egrets on the thing, and I've been getting great white egrets. I don't know who they are, probably just after frogs. Um, but I haven't even seen those out in the moss. And a few years ago, you know, uh, it would have been a mega sort of bird in, in Shropshire, a great white egret. Um, um, uh, maybe not as many sandpipers turning up now. It always used to be a good sight for the flooded fields. We're still getting some, but probably not quite in the numbers. But they had a lot of little ring clubbers this year. So um, it sort of swings and roundabouts mm. like that. Um, as I say, um, I think invertebrates, a lot of like dragonflies and damselflies, a lot smaller than um, nowhere near the numbers there were in the past. The hobbies, the last few years, we've had some poor springs, you know, around May cold weather and that and um, so the hobbies don't hang around but if they, they're not feeding on dragonflies so. very interesting observation thank you. thank you well if there are no more questions then i'd like to offer a vote of thanks on every everybody's behalf i'm um, sorry if uh, my uh, <coughs> sound is um, echoing um but it seems to me that this week uh, and last week, we've really been spoiled by two expert speakers from the borders. Last week, uh, Stephen, we had Keith Offord, who I imagine you know well. He doesn't live that far from you. And he gave us a splendid talk on raptors. And one of the features were the images. And it's been the same tonight, really, because not only have we heard uh, your commentary, which is expert in itself, about one particular amazing reserve but also we've been treated to the most wonderful images and i don't think i've seen or heard many talks which have captured the essence of a place or a habitat as well as yours has this evening through through the images uh, they were absolutely exceptional and i found myself making notes of some of the most outstanding ones and uh, i just kept going because there were just so many you started with that wonderful shot, a general shot of a murmuration, a large murmuration, and that was very atmospheric. It really gave a, a super impression of what your wonderful Fenswicks or Moss must look like uh, now and for the next few few months. Um, and then when you got onto some of the, the bird portraits, I mean, they were staggering, um, particularly, I think, where you were showing predation, uh, for example, a hobbies, uh, with common hawkers in their mouths or in their talons, uh, to get that level of sharpness and detail was just exceptional. And to capture that moment, which, yes, you, one can describe it, but to actually illustrate it um, was a wonderful treat. Um, then there were other beautiful pictures. Uh, there was a lovely one of wheat ear, probably taken about this time of the year, uh, on Bracken, uh, with that light tan background. Uh, it just epitomized uh, a particular time of the year and a particular moment when a bird is is passing through your area. Um, it was lovely to have sh exceptional shots of things like Chetis warbler, which, as you said, are so hard to see, of reed buntings and chiff chaps uh, feeding intimately and catching aphids. That I have never seen um, reproduced as an image. And that lovely picture of willow warbler, the light quality was just fabulous. Um, there was lots uh, to take on, take in, in terms of information, particularly about birds that we're equally concerned about, such as the curlew. And what a nice link um, you offered us between Anglesey and Fenswixel with that, uh, that curlew movement between wintering grounds here on Anglesey and breeding grounds there in Shropshire. Fascinating, and I really hope as much <coughs> research can be done uh, using the satellite tags as possible to help link our two areas. Um, it was nice also to hear some audio of the birds as you showed their images. Thank you for that. That was quite a novelty. Um, yes, I, I won't go on, but there was lots more. That kestrel with the lizard 
was wonderful. And yeah, the thermal imaging of night jars. Thank you very much for that. That was splendid uh, and almost abstract, that last image uh, of a night jar uh, on a tree at night, but the, the color and yeah, it's spectacular. Um, you obviously know your stuff, your place, um, and like nobody else. Um, and as ever, it, it's always so good to hear it firsthand from somebody that is such a good field naturalist. Um, you revealed far more than, than most people will ever, ever see. Um, and you condensed it for us into an hour this evening, which was thoroughly enjoyable. I'm sure many like me who've not been to Fenswick's all will want to go as soon as we can uh, and see this great place. Um, and all strength to those that are managing it really very well indeed. It's an exceptional area um, and it sounds like it's in good hands. And part of that is the close monitoring on a day-to-day -day, season by season basis, which uh, you do so superbly well, Stephen. Thank you for taking the time um, to articulate all that you know this evening through your commentary and your fine images. Um, and we look forward to perhaps meeting up uh, with the bloke with the bike uh, as soon as we can. Thank you on behalf of us all.